there's a gentleman in 1933 called Sir Franklin Roosevelt. He came in at a very important time in the American history when there was what you could call very serious crisis. You know, pandemic times are crisis time. Very challenging times. And in this time in America, it was, he just came into office on the 4th of March, 1933, when he was sworn in. And he met a banking crisis. In fact, it will interest you to know that everyone who had put money in the banking system, they were going to withdraw their monies because banks were failing. And the, and the rumor all over town was that if you don't go get your money, your money will disappear. And you know, the banking system is actually the strength of the economy. And everybody was going to the bank to collect their monies. And this man was sworn in as president. He was sworn in at a very challenging time in the history of America. But like the type of leadership that is expected in a challenging time is usually very different. And this man stood up, showed up, and began to provide that type of leadership I'd like to share with you today. And when he began to provide that type of leadership, the interesting thing that happened is that he immediately declared a four-day holiday, banking holiday, a, you know, extraordinary banking holiday, and began to mobilize all the stakeholders in that particular banking industry or financial system. And we were working out a bill, the banking emergency bill, and for three days, they worked on the bill with all the stakeholders. And when they finally got it right, they, for the first time, I'm telling you, in the American legislative system, the Congress passed that bill. When the Congress passed that bill, this president I'm talking to you about went to his radio chat program that he designed and he spoke to the American people. He inspired the American people. He spoke life to them and gave them the solution that he has created from that emergency bill. You know what happened the next day? Everybody watched as everyone who had collected money from the bank, they went back the next day and dropped back their monies in the bank. And that was how the banking system was actually sustained. That was how it was solved. That was why, how that the entire American economy was saved. It was the first thing that he did. And to be very honest with you, he became one of my models when I'm talking about leading in challenging times, leading in times of uncertainty. And the truth of the matter is that it's no longer the same. Now, the interesting thing is that, you know, we woke up one morning and we heard about something called COVID-19. I'm sure a lot of us have not heard of that before. And very, very sad thing is that it's not in this country, somewhere in Wuhan, China. But every news agency in the world, every news system, they carried it. And the interesting thing is that the way and manner the news was carried, it brought about so much fear within the system. The entire system never remained the same again. It disrupted the entire system. The economic reality of that disruption is what we have been dealing with for the last couple of months. And the interesting thing is that most people have lost jobs. A lot of people have lost their jobs. Some of them are our relatives. A lot of people are now depressed, depressed as a result of the disruptions of the daily activities that would have had. The type of transformation that has happened within this country called Nigeria as a result of 
even declining revenue is unbelievable. But do you know one interesting thing there? Is that this thing that happened in Wuhan, China has locked down the world and has created a new economic order. That new economic order requires another type of leadership. It can never be business as usual. It requires another kind of leadership because everybody that you see, including you that is seated here, quite a lot of us right now, correct, people are literally emotionally right now, the current mandate that you have right now to help this country since the oil resources are no longer enough in that sense. It can be overwhelming, am I correct? I want to speak to leaders who understand the times that we are in. It is called the most interesting time in history. And so, because we are dealing with human beings, we are dealing with the workforce, we are dealing with the stakeholders, everybody that you see today is emotionally, most people are emotionally challenged. As I'm talking to you today, the number of people that probably that have committed suicide as a result of this pandemic, it will shock you, you know, literally. People who were not used to staying in the house, a lot of them are staying in the house with people that they don't love. And those people are in their faces. And this has been the reality. So in all of these disruptions, what are the type of leadership competencies that is needed? That if as a leader, that you have these competencies, it can change your life completely. It can help you to actually become the best that you can ever be. It can help you in order to be able to make the type of impact that is necessary. There, there, is, there is every time and season, there are different types of leadership that is required. In times like this, there are leadership competencies that are key. And the first of all of those leadership competencies I like to be able to bring to your face this leadership is mind leadership. Mind, mind mind leadership. If you don't take the responsibility of being the CEO of your mind today, I mean the chief executive officer of your mind, what is happening around you can drown you as a leader. Every staff that is working under your system, quote me, is emotionally challenged. The ones that have lost their jobs are depending on you. Am I correct? Some of you are so breadwinners in the family. Just this afternoon, I have had three of, three of my, my mom, my two sisters in the hospital. This afternoon, I know how much I have transferred already in just to make sure that every one of them is okay. Do you understand what I'm saying? And I know what I just did today. Several of you have done much more. Some of you are managing all man. Do you know how many people have lost their lives within the last year and now? Do you know, do you know if you don't, as a leader, rise to take charge of your mind and lead your mind to ensure that only the things you permit to penetrate this mind will stay in the mind. You will automatically lose it. And when you lose it, those who are following you, what will happen to them? <laughs> what will happen to them? They are literally, they cannot succeed. Leadership will now start from you. Who, so you have to find a way to take charge of your environment, your mind, such that they 
realities, the economic realities, the social realities, do not penetrate your mind and keep you from not being the best you can ever be. So leadership mind, mindset I'm talking to you about, leadership, my leadership is the ability to consciously create a state, a state of joy, peace, happiness. You deliberately create it. You create a state of control where you protect your mind from external threats. The external threat we're talking about could be fear of the unknown, the fear of uncertainty, the fear of the future, the fear of what all of these, none of us have any solution to what is going on right now in this country, right? The fear of the unknown, the fear of the security situation in this country alone, the fear of all of those dimensions. I mean, you are traveling from one part of the country to the other, you might not even necessarily know whether you are going to get there or not. Is that correct? Do you know the emotional stress that puts you? How do you protect your mind such that those stuff do not come to you? How do you protect yourself from small talk and gossip? You know that's what you call executive gossip? Executive gossip, how do you? When someone within your team is engaging with another executive at some point in time and they are discussing you in a way that you never imagine. How do you deal with that? How do you deal with that? How do you deal with, you work so hard and you are not appreciated. How do you deal with that? So protecting your mind is critical in these times. And if there is anything you can get from me today, mind leadership is the most important. When you protect your mind, what it means is that you can now lead because your mind is protected. You take charge of the security of your mind. Your mind can now be allowed to do what it's supposed to do because anything that is a thought that is a wrong thought stays too much in your mind can disrupt Let's take for instance, this man, this guy, I don't like him. It's a thought. I don't like this guy. I don't like that guy. It begins to build up, right? It begins to build up. After a while, it will become so deeply seated in your mind that you can't function. Has anybody experienced that? It is so real that we do not discuss this. And that's why, if you know, in every Fortune 500 company in America, you have psychologists who are paid working within those systems to just do what? To actually talk to staff. Why do they have to do that in order to be able to ensure that everybody is in the right that perform their task. So mind leadership is critical. It's one of the latest discoveries that if you can get your mind leadership right, you are ready to face the future. This is what we need in this time. So you protect your mind so that your mind can only have those positive emotions that can inspire you to continue to grow and be the best that you can ever be. Those positive emotions that you can share in an environment so your mind is not toxic. You become a man who walks into a room and all what emanates from you is inspiration, is excitement, is, is joy. People leave your presence, they want to come back again. There are people that you leave their presence, you don't want to come back again. Am I correct? In fact, one woman was asked, she has had the opportunity of spending time with two former presidents, Prime Ministers of England, Benjamin Disraeli and David Gladstone. And she was asked, what is it like? Tell me your experience. I haven't stayed in the presence of these two leaders. You know what she said? She said, you are in the presence of David Gladstone. You will think that David Gladstone is the most intelligent being that has ever lived. But if you spend time with Benjamin Disraeli, you will think that Benjamin, you will think yourself, yourself, you as the individual, you are the most interesting human being that has ever lived. Who can tell me the difference? 
What's the difference? The difference is that when you are in the presence of Benjamin Disraeli, you are inspired. He makes you feel great. He makes you feel good. There are leaders that you leave their presence and they make you feel like you're nothing. And I want you to watch the way you also treat those other younger people that also come into your presence. I'm telling you the truth, that those things, most of the time, people never forget the way you make them feel. They never forget it. So that's why we have to get our mind leadership right. The second leadership that is important in times like this is visionary leadership. When you have institutions, when you have systems that do not have this type of visionary leadership I'm talking to you about, what happens is that the growth process in that system is very slow. Is that correct? Can I show you an example of what I'm talking about so you can see what I'm saying? Can I have about five volunteers? Five volunteers willing to come out. Let me show you what I'm talking to you about. Can I have five volunteers? Thank you very much. Five volunteers, please. Let me show you. I want to be as practical as possible so you can know what I'm talking about. Five volunteers, please come. So you stay here. Watch and see what happens when there is no visionary leadership in a system. Great. So look at all of them. Face this way. You face this way. Face this way. No, face that way. Fantastic. So, can you just move backward? Just move backward. Move backward. Watch and see what happens, sirs. Move backward. Just move. Okay, great. You are the leader of this institution right now. You are the assistant, right? Good. Now you close your eyes. You close your eyes. You close your eyes. You close your eyes. You open your eyes, but don't say a word. When I ask you to come, watch. When I ask you to come, just come. Don't open your eyes, please. Let's watch this and see. So, all of you, just come to me when, when I ask you to come. All right? Please don't open your eyes, I beg you. Watch this, sirs. Please come to me. Take a look at these people. Sir, take a look at these people, sir. Who is the team leader here? That's the team leader. See where the team leader is. These ones are not even moving at all. <laughs> see where they are. See the see, where, what position were you? Number three. See where this man is. Sir, sir, in truth, in truth, sir, in truth, sir, in departments, in departments, when there is no vision in a department, this is what happens. In reality, yes, this is what happens. You can have one team with four different directions, understanding, and everybody's pulling in a different direction. Stagnation. No movement. But there's activity, plenty of activity. See the step this man took. Long one. You, you understand what I'm saying? Now, if you see, if we change this order, the person was at the back. I said, he saw what was going on. He knew that there was no vision. But, you know, he has always told this man, so we're going in the wrong direction. This man is always not listening. This man says, do you know how many years I've been here? I know it all. <laughs> do you understand? Then, 
after a while, you know what happens? This lady, because she's enjoying, she's enjoying her small, small earnings. She says, I don't want to be removed. So let me better stay and enjoy. So she watches the team continue to underperform. Does that make sense? She don't look. Now, but if you change this model, sir, please come back, sir. Change this model, please, sir. <laughs> so, so after a three-day after a three-day leadership session has been held with the team, the department. Now they are more informed. See what happened. So open your eyes. Open your eyes. Open your eyes. Open your eyes. Close your eyes. But when you hear full, that's what I'm saying. Your eyes are closed, but all of them are open. If I say to you, come to me, watch and see how this works. Come to me. Did you see what has confusion? <laughs> The, the interesting thing is that, to be very honest, the challenge of states, the challenge of organizations, the challenge of countries, most of it is visionary challenge. Because there's no vision. In fact, there, no vision transfer. You can have a vision and you don't transfer. If you don't transfer the vision, the vision is nothing. Vision is nothing if it is not acted upon it's nothing thank you very much i appreciate thank you sir thank you thank you so in challenging times like this that is when leaders create big vision people think that in challenging times reduce their vision no in challenging times what do you do you increase what the vision and you begin to sell it and by the time the crisis has ended realize that you have built a system that is working so so visionary leadership is key go find out every leader that is visionary that is able to articulate the vision make it clear is able to transfer it is, is able to uh, be accountable to the vision that institution never remain the same even your family you can set a vision for the way you want your family to go and you create the core values. I'm glad when the other man was talking about core values. That's where you can create a core value. A core value system. Okay, for instance, in this department, in this group, you might decide to say this is our vision, but this is our core value. Sit down, what are the core values we need? Everybody sits down, brainstorm, you work it out, stretch yourself out, and at the end of the day, you come out with four. Four core values. And the core value is to be lived out if we must complete the vision. Is that correct? Now, if I ask right now in this department, the four core values of this department, number one is what? Professionalism. Professionalism. Number two is what? Efficiency. Efficiency. Number three is what? Integrity. Number four is what? What did he say? Ownership. Ownership. Correct. Now, the, these core values, I see them a lot on the walls. A company with mission statements and vision statements. That is where they stay. In practice, you hardly see it on the system. Am I correct? So, if you want to reinvent the organization in times of crisis, you create a vision and reinvent your core values and begin to start afresh. It's like all starting afresh again. I don't know if that works. So that's the thing, visionary leadership. The next one is collaborative leadership. Collaborative leadership. You know, when there's crisis, people like to work together in crisis. You know why they work together? Because most of them are afraid. If, there is, if you live in an estate and there is fire, in the estate, you call for a meeting, everybody comes. <laughs> if somebody is being robbed in an estate, somebody was robbed yesterday, you call for a meeting, everybody who has never attended a meeting, they come. Why? Why do we normally do that? Yeah. Yeah? It's fear. So why can't it be norm? 
how, why can't working with people, bringing different resources together, everybody coming in with an idea, coming with some, some intelligence, coming with something outstanding, why don't we pull our resources together and make things happen? Why is it difficult to work together in this part of the world? Why? Why? Dr. Professor John Adair was, was requested, one of the greatest men I've ever met. John Adair is the first professor of leadership in the world. And he's about 80 something years. I brought him three times to Nigeria and he trained in the UK. He told me a story in 2019, November. I went to his country home in Surrey and he gave me 20 books as a gift. I was dancing. 20 books. One of the books he wrote 50 years ago. And he told a story. He said there was a company in London that was doing well before. The company was successful, powerful. But you know what? After a while, that company started going down. There was what? Decline. Decline. As the company was going down, they rushed out to John Adair, come and help us. So John Adair went into the company for a couple of days to do his consulting work, to interact with the people. What he found was unbelievable. That <laughs> the problem of the company was simple, little, little things like jealousy, envy, envy, small talk, <laughs> magic, little, little things that just think so teams can no longer work together because one person will not deliver because he wants the other person to fail. If you sit down and have a meeting and you say all documents will be submitted for collation for so 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 time, one or two persons will not bring their own documents. And because if that department fails, everybody's punished. So when he saw what was going on, he created a model and locked them up in a couple of days of training and retraining and reinvestment and sharing. And after a while, six months after, this company made one, made one billion pounds in profit because they fixed it. Slit, the things we take for granted. We take for granted. Same issues like procrastination, just procrastination, little issues like that, procrastination. Do it now, I'll do it later. It's like that. And they fished it out. And I said, whoa! People that you have not forgotten who are within your system and they are posted by you and you're working with, together with them and you just disconnect. So the work suffers for people's misrelationship. So the call for a new order of collaboration, sharing information. You know, people coming together to say, you can, it's some, somebody who is posted in Kaduna, right? Can, you know, call somebody who is, uh, what do you call it? Because to share, you know, you are making some progress. How are you making the progress? Can you share with me? What is that called? It's collaborative leadership. The ability to be able to pull everybody to working together to accomplish a task. Bringing all the resources together to accomplish a task. Now, the task we're talking about here, you know your mandate that has been given you. You can't do it alone. Can you do it alone? Nobody can do it alone. You need everybody working together as a team to make it happen. So collaborative leadership in times like this will generate the type of result that is unimaginable. It's very, very key. The next one that is critical is executive intelligence. Executive intelligence. Is there any other time than now that leaders need very sound critical thinking in decision making. Is there anything that, that, that in difficult times like this, if you make a mistake, everybody can go. The safety of people can be compromised as a result of one single mistake. 
Nobody can afford to make that mistake. In order for you not to make that mistake, what you must do is, how do you create a team of smart and intelligent people around you as a leader in order to support you to succeed because everybody is coming together with great ideas and are thinking it through until it becomes something that is a solution for the system. And intelligence, executive intelligence also says that as I bring people together, it means that even though I'm the boss, guess what? My idea, in the middle of my promoting my idea, somebody in the middle of that team, who it might be a younger person, might have an idea that is smarter than my own. My idea and say, let's take this guy's idea. It's executive intelligence. When you do that, you know what it does? Is that it, it gets people to speak freely and get the type of result that you need. You need that type of ex executive intelligence to succeed. Otherwise, people will not succeed. Trust me, when you allow mediocres in that space and all what they do is praise singing, sir, those your ideas are fantastic. In fact, they are the best ideas we have ever found. <laughs> you say you you having a meet how can you be having a meeting with 12 people 12 senior people having a meeting with them and you are asking what's your opinion do you, what, what do you think he says no sir it's okay sir you say you are good, sir it's in fact you are the everything you say is correct all correct sir i have seen things happen and everybody's like you know why they are afraid to talk they are afraid to talk because the man doesn't have executive intelligence. Because, you know, most of the time, people are afraid of more intelligent people. You don't need to. You draft them in. You are the boss. And I'm talking to everybody because every one of you, you have someone who is looking up to you. Is that correct? You have somebody who is looking up to you. So how do you bring the best minds to critique every issue is discussed dispassionately. And at the end of the day, you find the best solutions to it. Everybody together. And the one that is the best wins. It doesn't matter where it comes from. That's executive intelligence. How do you create that as a pool? How do you also understand that power to be able to use intel executive intelligence to create such a success within the organization because you are thinking any thinking organization is a growth based organization if everybody is a thinker even in your family you have to start helping your children to think to think in your family meeting can't you democratize it the error if you utilize this old model of command and control in the family unit you have lost them Am I correct? You have lost them. Command and control. And there, you will study medicine. Medicine. You will do accounting. You, you, I don't have lawyer in this house. You are the lawyer. Bam. But daddy, I love music. Shut up. I'm the one that is paying your school fees. He said, no, no problem, sir. He's lost. In the university, he will never enter class. He will go and do his music behind your back <laughs> at the end of the day. So you are in another generation. And the fact that you know we are now in times like this, in crisis times like this, it is time for you to embrace a process of uh, executive intelligence. Allow that to happen. Let the knowledge build up. And that's why I say to people, I say to people, if you want to be relevant in systems, one of the things that you can do, you can become a perpetual learner for life. The perpetual learner. Let me ask, for the past, let's say for the past five years, how many of you in this room, you have read up to 50 books? For the past five years, you have read up to 50 books? Eh? <laughs> Oga? See? I'm trying to. I, so, uh, what is it? So, how many of you have read up to 50 books? 
50. Oga, you're laughing. Now, let me say this. Let me say this, sir. Any, any books? Any, I mean, books. What, what is books? Great books. Books that can help you to become greater than you are now. Even if it is textbook, yes, it's okay to become the best you can be. In, you, in whatever book you can imagine, in your industry, if you want to develop as a person, it must not only be textbook that you should read. You only read three promotional exams. <laughs> Oga, you have a system. They say they only read three promotional exams. So if you only read three promotional exams, that's cram work. Cram work means after the exam, what happens to you? You're back to zero again. Now, let me, let me share this with you. Because it's a global, it's globalization has happened. Globalization has happened, right? The world is no longer far apart. Distance is now dead. And because distance is dead, the implication of that is your competition is no longer local. Your competition is now international. What it means is that you are competing with the very best in the world. So if they send you to represent this tax office in Washington, D.C., you are not saying, I'm going with Nigerian standard. You can't go to Washington, D.C. and you raise your hand. Uh, you raise your hand, you say, this, this, give me a microphone. You say, <laughs> <laughs> you, can't, uh, you can't afford to do that. You can't afford to do that. But here, it's acceptable though. It's acceptable here. But on that stage, right, your way, the way you carry yourself must change. The way you introduce yourself must change. That's what we call five seconds, 30 seconds introduction. How do you introduce yourself in a public forum like that? How do you bring some energy on the floor? There's competition going on. The Indians will be the ones that will take the front seat. Front seat. And they make sure that they are ready to, to be issuing out the solutions while you are in the meeting. And some Nigerians will go and be sleeping. Or shopping malls. In my class in Dubai, it has happened. I was taking a course in Dubai and it was a very quality class very high level course and you had the first group of people i saw were the indians so we might need to study them they went and took front seats and strategically i didn't see them move throughout that they were there from beginning to the end the guys from nigeria see what they did they came like the fourth row, kept their bags there and said, excuse me, sir, Cotichia, we are coming. I'm not joking, we're coming. And I never saw them until the end of the program. I'm not joking. We are talking about international competition here. And people are talking about, so what we're saying is a serious matter. The other day, in the Harvard class in, in the Act and Practice of Leadership, 62 of us were in class. The best of the best from around the world. And 11 came from Australia. I was studying the, 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 the numbers. Some came from Canada. Some came from different parts of the world. But do you know what? Only two came from Africa to understudy the trend, the current trend on leadership too came from Africa, one from Morocco, one from Nigeria. I felt so bad, but you know what? Just, I peeped into the business school. This is Kennedy School. I peeped into the business school and almost the business courses, I saw Nigerians plenty in class. I saw <laughs> the Nigerians were many in those business courses. I said, why? Why? What do you say? They want to succeed. The greatest problem facing Africa is what? Leadership. And if leadership is the greatest problem facing Africa, why are we not spending more resources to develop the next generation of leaders for this country? Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? And people make all the money. Why are we not investing in leadership development? America spends $180 billion every year for leadership development. In, in this, your company, leadership development should be one of the core areas. Does that make sense? 
Now, so what I'm saying to you is that I will volunteer today as I wrap up the remaining point. I volunteer today. I want to advise anybody listening to me today. If you want to be the best, and I don't care where you're from, if you want to be the best you can be, I want to advise that one book per week, one book per week will be a must for you. I'm not joking. One book per week. It doesn't matter. Sir, people will argue that we don't have time. You know, people argue we don't have time. Have you gone to see somebody and they keep you waiting for three hours? Have you gone to see somebody in this country and they keep you waiting for three hours? When you go to the airport and they, they keep you hours waiting for flight, right? 12 hours. What do you do in 12 hours? Eh? What you do is information, information overload. WhatsApp. WhatsApp. Facebook. You spend, if you notice, calculate it. The hours you spend on Facebook, WhatsApp, and other unrelated matters that can add value to your life, trust me, it's enough to do five books a week. I want to challenge you. Who is ready to be challenged? Who wants to go with me? One book per week. I want to increase your value. It's not my value. If you understand this, some of you think your life doesn't end in, in, in this company. After here, you are making other progresses outside here. The last thing I want to say is emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence. You can have 80% competencies in other areas. You can be professional, you know your job, your technical area, you're the best in it. But when it comes to human relations, you are zero. If you don't know how to relate with human beings right now in doing your job, most of the time you will succeed in the technical side of it, but in the human relation side of it you fail. And anything that does not inspire human beings is failure. Emotional intelligence is having that skill, the competence to relate with people to first of all know your emotional state per time, understand who you are as a person, and also understand the emotions of those walking through your space. <laughs> there are people walking within your space who might be in another temperament zone. They, they, they have a temperament that is different from yours, but you judge them on the basis of those temperaments and take decisions that do not favor them. Like, comment, and subscribe to watch more videos on leadership by Dr. Linus Okorie.